the one thing that always resonates with me from the time of the famine is how many Irish people emigrated. It's the kind of thing where you're sitting thinking, if that hadn't happened, how many people would be living in Ireland? What would Ireland be like now? The famine is an open wound in Ireland. It is a glaring wound. There's the population still hasn't recovered. The language has never recovered. It had huge impacts culturally in terms of the Irish language, many of those poorer communities. Irish was their only spoken language, and so the language was decimated, absolutely decimated. On the eve of the famine, Ireland had been home to 8.2 million people, making it the most populous part of the United Kingdom after England. One in every three of Queen Victoria's subjects were Irish. Most of them Catholic, most of them poor, living in small rural settlements, and four million of them totally reliant on a single crop, the potato. A crop that was planted in ridges that can still be seen on the landscape today, alongside the remains of abandoned villages. When a disease, the potato blight, wiped out a third of the crop in 1845, the British government sent shipments of cheap American wheat to feed the poor of Ireland, and established a commission to oversee and coordinate relief efforts. But in 1846, the blight returned, and that year destroyed almost the entire crop, leaving millions of poor Irish people to face starvation. These are petitions, letters written to the authorities by the cottiers poor agricultural workers who were pleading for help. Once the second crop fails in the, in the summer, July, August of, of 1846, and, you know, disaster is, is approaching for a large body of people, millions of people, really. They're petitioning for help to be given food, to be given shelter. Um, there's, a, there's a whole host of reasons why people are petitioning. So here we have the petition of Philip Lynch, Petitioner states that he is nine of a family and that he is out of employment for the last month and that he is in a very bad state, in fact, nothing to support his family, and he hopes that Your Honour will consider his state and get him some employment that will enable him to support his family. If he does not get some employment for himself, the family must be lost. Must be lost? Must be lost. He's saying his family are going to die if they can't find him work. They've witnessed a lot of death in the locality, so he knows that, that that's, that's what's going to happen. We have another petition here from Catherine Brady of Lappin, and Catherine Brady has seven in, in her family. 11, 12, 13 in a family is not uncommon. Again, she's appealing for assistance and to be provided work. What's important about this letter, I suppose, is that she says that if she doesn't uh, receive relief, her family will inevitably starve. So there's no other option, there's no other outcome. That They're going to die unless she's given relief. The relief that Catherine Brady and Philip Lynch were appealing for was to be given employment on public work schemes that had been set up across Ireland to provide work and therefore some income to those left hungry by the failure of the potato crop. And across Ireland, 700,000 men, women and children facing starvation were put to work. We must remember that the young and old are working side by side on these schemes. So there's children, you know, as young as 10, 11 years of age. There's men and women in their 60s, 70s. There's reports of, of people dying, just collapsing from hunger and exhaustion, and, and the works carry on. So you're making people who are unwell because of malnutrition, work, do hard labour to get food to address the malnutrition? Yes, yeah, yeah. And what's the ideology behind that? Why not just feed people who are hungry? The ideology is that if they, if they provide people, they become lazy, and that Ireland will be better for it in the long run if people are, are actually um, working um, rather than and receiving um, relief or handouts effectively. The worst year of the Great Famine was 1847. In June of that year, the British government began to directly feed the poor of Ireland. Over 1,800 soup kitchens were set up, and at their height, they were feeding three million people. But later that same year, 
the government decided that the worst of the famine was over and most of the soup kitchens and the public works were wound down. As the British economy slipped into recession, the government also decided that any famine relief for Ireland had now to be paid for only through taxes raised in Ireland. For thousands of desperate people, those decisions left only one place to turn to, the dreaded workhouses. And when the workhouses were overwhelmed by hundreds of thousands of starving people, those who could headed for Ireland's ports. In the years after the Great Famine, the Irish emigrants slowly became Irish Americans, part of a community who not only sent money back to their lost homeland, but who increasingly offered support to a growing campaign for Irish independence from Britain and an end to the Union. Before the famine, Ireland had been home to over 8 million people. By the famine's end, 1 million had died and over a million had emigrated. Even today, in the 21st century, Ireland has still not returned to the population levels of 1845. The potato blight was a natural disaster, but the United Kingdom, the richest, most powerful nation on earth at the center of a vast empire, it had the money and it had the power to intervene decisively. But for reasons that were economic, ideological, political, and religious, Britain's leaders failed Ireland. And that failure ensured that the Great Famine became the great rupture in Irish history and eventually in the history of the Union.